Dear fellow citizens of God's heavenly kingdom, what do you usually picture when you think about a kingdom and things pertaining to a kingdom? My guess is that many of us would picture a like European style medieval castle with very big, very thick walls made out of uh, large, enormous stones. And on top of those very thick walls, there's tall parapets where archers hang out and shoot their bows and arrows and stuff. There's a, there's a large moat around the castle for defense so people can't just like ride right up there and get right in. There's an iron or steel portcullis that can be slammed down and slammed up and it all sounds very impressive. And then add to all of that stuff, there is all of the uh, brightly colored, highly ordained tapestry artwork and symbolism that gets you to think of uh, the kingdom in which you're in. It projects uh, an air of accomplishment and communicates to people that they can take care of their people's needs, their own interests, and absolutely obliterate any aggressors, right? Rule, might, power, the ability to impose one's will sometimes by force to the point of taking someone else's life, that's sometimes what we think of when it comes to kingdom stuff too, isn't it? Think about, in fact, most of the kingdoms that we do study in history, these are the ones that were the best at imposing their will over and against other people. Jesus talks about God's kingdom, though, in a way that is entirely different. By complete opposite end of the spectrum, it shatters our notions of, of what a kingdom is, how it's established, how it grows, uh, what the people in it become like and what they turn out to be. And it's quite a bit different from what our usual thinking is. It has nothing to do with swords or, or weaponry. God's kingdom's not about a, a bunch of guns or tanks, or battleships, or jets. It's not even about power, or control, or influence. It's about welcome, and grace, and forgiveness, and growth, and life. And that's what Jesus was teaching the people. So, so many people, actually, that earlier in Mark, Chapter four, Mark records that Jesus was so crowded when he was down by the beach of the Sea of Galilee that he hopped up into the prow of a ship, maybe Peter's boat, and he began talking to the people a lot more there. Um, he says that there were different soils earlier on, right? And the word was thrown out to those different soils and he talks about each one's. And then he talks about being light as part of being a part of God's kingdom. But then... Then he talks about this, the first verses for our gospel reading this morning. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head, all by itself. That is an absolutely important major thing for us to take away from this first part of the first parable that Jesus tells us about what the kingdom of heaven is like to him. All by itself, the seed grows. The guy just tosses it on the ground and he falls asleep and he wakes up and then it just sprouts and grows and becomes this thing that produces other grain that you can actually eat and live off of. And it does all that amazing stuff by itself. How many people in the room here uh, drove to church this morning, today? All right. How many people in the room know the finer points, all the nuts and bolts of how an internal combustion engine works? No, we, we got like the, the big ideas, right? 
uh, I know that for, for me, I, I push a button on my car and it unlocks. I don't know how, it just kind of does it though. Uh, and then once I'm in the car, seated there, I, I push a button and it starts. I don't know how, it just does it though, it's a pretty good deal. And then I, I touch this, the long flat pedal on the floor, right? I touch that accelerator and car go, car go fast when I touch the pedal. I don't, I don't know how, it just kind of does it. I can't really tell you how it advances up through the gears in my transmission because I don't know, it just does it kind of automatically whether or not I know how it works. It does this thing. The crop, whether or not the man is there with the chart watching it, keeping track of things, it just grows by itself. And then, very literally, this next verse is big, what Jesus says in verse 29. It's a huge idea too. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now, very literally, it doesn't say like when the grain is ripe, like that then the the harvest can happen. More literally, it says, like when the fruit or the grain permits it, then the harvest can happen. Now, what happens if you're in an orchard and you walk by an apple tree and you go to pluck an apple and it's not quite ready yet? You bring about half of the tree with you for a step, right? And then it snaps back. It doesn't do us any good to try and yank fruit off of the vine or off of the tree before it's ready because then you get fruit that isn't ripe and a damaged plant. Besides all that, harvesting isn't even our job. Harvesting is God's job and he knows exactly when to do it. And since that's the case, let's not expect people to be ripe or to bear fruits that indicate that they are ready for harvest before God knows that they are ready. Our tasks from God are to scatter seed, to plant it, right? To water it, and then just be patient. No amount of intervention will make the fruit grow the way we want it to grow when we think it should grow. It will do that on its own time, on God's way. No amount of rules, no amount of legislating certain aspects of our faith will make God's kingdom come and bud and flourish in a time that fits our schedule and our observation. We can't pass enough rules that flow from Christian teachings in order to bring about a deep or genuine or real heartfelt change in a person and make God's kingdom happen over there. We can't present a better slate of rules, but these these are Christian rules and give them to people and repeat them over and over and over again and just say, well, Jesus was like this, So now you go and be like that and expect people to actually want to do it or be able to. Doesn't work that way. But we we fall into the trap of thinking so regularly that it does. Because it would just be easier sometimes, right? But people can't be forced into the kingdom of God through social or political or military force. We got to stop thinking that maybe if we passed the right rules and here we are in a presidential election year, a presidential election summer, and my goodness, there are commercials left and right all over the place. We can't think though, that if we elect the right person to enforce the right rules, that maybe then the conditions will be right for God's kingdom to come. That way of thinking is just breathtakingly wrong doesn't work that way. God's kingdom is going to grow all by itself when the seed is scattered, when the word of God goes out into the world, because that's exactly what God's word, according to God's powerful promise, is going to do. Doesn't require civic or secular mechanisms in order for the conditions to be just right 
for that to happen. No, God's word just does these things constantly because that is what God has made it to do, that the gospel is, is excellent. So we invite and t- people to taste and see that the gospel is good and that his word is good. That is what the kingdom is all about. Grace, and sharing, and invite. It is about having in one's heart the rule of Christ, who's the king of grace and knowing him, right? Knowing that he, he left heaven f- for you, that he w- was born in Bethlehem for you, that he died on a cross outside of Jerusalem to take away all of your sins, that he broke out of the grave outside of Jerusalem too to open up life for everybody who believes in him. That is God's kingdom. That's what you stand on. That's what we stand on. That's what we celebrate. And that's what we also are here to learn more of, to be able to better give away, scatter and share and watch God make it grow. Jesus says another excellent thing in verse 30 about the kingdom of God. And I, like, I love the way that he just begins this. He's been talking for a while already, saying some parables, but then he slows it down a little bit. He asks this, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Why does Jesus ask this at all? Has Jesus drawn a blank? Did Jesus, the almighty, all-knowing Lord, the greatest teacher of all time, did he run out of things to use to describe to people and explain to them what the kingdom of God is like? No, not at all. What Jesus is doing, he's, he's drawing people in, right? You see how masterful Jesus is at regaining people's attention? He doesn't want people to just be content to know that he is saying things. He doesn't want people to just muse about this for a little while, but he wants his listeners to actively engage their thought because trying to think about what the kingdom of God is like, putting forth that sort of brain effort is really good for us to do. And so Jesus beats everybody to the punch then by describing this all-glorious, majestic, Eternal kingdom, what object of all the things in this world could it be compared to? Well, it says a seed. Right? And not, not even like a, a big old, like impressive pine cone thing that grows into a sequoia, but like a tiny seed, a mustard seed that looks fragile and weak, but is alive and produces growth. Here's how Jesus talks about it says, it is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. You ever see a mustard tree before? Big old canopies on these things, not like a massive trunk or anything, but just sprawling canopies so that, like Jesus says, all kinds of birds can swoop in and rest and roost and live in its branches. Do we think of the church that way enough? I don't usually. Usually I tend to think of the church kind of more like how we described it at the beginning of the sermon. Psalm 46 does describe it that way too, right? Like a fortress, a castle, and when I'm feeling overwhelmed and when life is terrifying and I just want to be held secure, it's excellent to think of God and his kingdom as a mighty fortress that protects me. But it's just as important for us to think about God's kingdom this way too, because this is how Jesus describes it, as a place that exists to just be. And as a place that exists to just be an open invitation for other people to just come and be and find the stuff that they need for life. 
This is how the Bible's depicted the church for forever. Isaiah depicted it like a water returning to a desert landscape. Ezekiel in our Old Testament lesson this morning, like a shoot, right, transplanted and then growing into a massive cedar in which all different kinds of birds, all different kinds of people live. This is what God's kingdom is all about. That's what it is. And Jesus was telling this to the people in parables that they could have a picture to attach to it and so that they could understand these big and important things that it grows all by itself, that it is our job to plant and share the word and trust that Christ will make things grow. Even if it doesn't look like a whole lot is happening here, even if it looks like we're not flourishing, or that we are too fragile, or that we are being overcome. Not the case at all. God is actively at work, imperceptibly almost, growing it into big, lasting things that is a place of rest for people, where they can hear the stuff of life that Jesus has taken away their sins to. Amen. Please stand. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. To help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Manav, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.